I'll start this off by saying I grew up completely 100% adamant that the paranormal isn't real. It can all be rationalized and that people who believe in it haven't thought about it hard enough. I've made other posts on other subs about paranormal events that have happened in my life recently that have completely changed my mind, primarily about my neighbor's house. That's not what I'll be talking about today, though. I live in the Midwest. I live on a small, rural lot between a cornfield and a small forest in a camper. I've lived in this county my entire life. I know the entire county like the back of my hand. This being said, I've come to the conclusion that my experience around the rural and wooded parts of this county are crawlers. I'm 100% sure of it. I've had many encounters actually, none back to back, but they happen frequently. There is a forest slash part in the middle of the town that I've always hated at night since I was little. As I got older, my cousins and I thought getting scared was really fun. We'd go there at night on purpose, but never lasted long. I've always felt like I was being watched. This, on top of urban legends of people going missing here at night, made me feel really uneasy. Fast forward to a few years ago. I got married and I'm settling into life as a husband. I take my large all-black German shepherd, Fenrir, on walks with me at night. I always walk towards the park, but I usually don't enter it. The first time something weird happened was five years ago. I was walking Fenrir, and the woods to the front and to the right of me were silent. My dog started acting really anxious. He's usually a very stoic and quiet dog. He's 120 pounds and built like a tank. He looks very intimidating and he knows it. I heard rustling in the woods following me and I felt like I was being stalked. I ran home and that's the end of the first encounter. I had a few more encounters like that, but last year things really amped up. I was on a walk around 11.30 with Fenrir, my wife, and our little newer dog, Booger. He's a terrier chi mix. We're walking down the same path, and about three blocks away from the woods, four or so deer are sprinting out of the trees into the street towards us, and they seem terrified. Then I hear what I can only describe as what sounded like a human trying to mimic the sounds of a monkey. I thought it was silly, until recently, when I read that other guy's story who heard the same fucking thing. We laughed it off as some kids playing around. Once we get up to the woods and are walking parallel, we can clearly see two reflective eyes and a silhouette staring us down from the tree line. We also heard a deep growl, and then like a hissing sound, but it wasn't really high-pitched or anything. Both of our dogs acknowledged this as well. Finn started, and Booger growled a bit. I made a Facebook post on the community's Facebook group, and other people told similar stories around town. Around this time, I got a job as a tour guide slash maintenance for rail explorers. I'm working there again this year as well. We start April 1st. Basically, they take unused or tour-specific railroad sections that aren't used federally, and they have these pedal carts with motor assist on them that you can use to explore the tracks. It's really cool and really fun. The one I work at is like five minutes from where I live, and it goes through the woods in an inaccessible part of the county unless you float down the river and hike up steep, loose dirt hills. You go under one old car bridge, and you go over two multi-hundred-foot-length old trail bridges. The first one is larger and taller, and it's about 150 feet off the ground above the forest. The second goes over the river, about six months into the job, and it's full. We work until midnight sometimes, with the last tour leaving around 9 p.m. That means the last tour for the last two months of the year are in complete darkness. The way the job operates is with six employees, four get on the lead bike and two get on the rear. From the lead bike, we drop off one person at a busy intersection so they can flag traffic, and one person gets dropped off at the large train bridge that goes over the woods. 
The person at the bridge gives a short safety speech to the customers who stop and go one at a time over the bridge. The employee carts are much faster than the customer ones. We all have walkie-talkies, and we usually have these battery-powered floodlights on stands that we use so the customers can see us and light up safety vests. On one particular night, we were behind by 20 or so minutes. Instead of leaving the depot at sunset, we were leaving at dusk. I was stationed at the high bridge. By the time we reached the bridge, it was pitch black, aside from the stars providing a little light. My co-workers dropped me off and waited with me until the first customer arrived. I gave the little speech to the first cart of four. I chatted with them a bit. I was trying to buy some time and wait for the next customer cart, so there wasn't a massive gap for my co-workers, who have to flip the bikes around. After a few minutes, I let these customers leave and I was alone. I was alone for 20 minutes. I used the radio so many times, but it was static for everybody. It was one of the only times we've ever had an issue like that as well. I kept seeing movement in the tree line. I kept hearing fast footsteps all around me in every direction. I had the floodlight on above my head, so everyone and everything could see me, but I couldn't see shit. I turned off the floodlight and used my personal flashlight. I kept seeing quick glimpses of pale skin moving quickly, but right when I started seeing stuff, I could hear the next customer cart coming close, so I turned the light back on and waited for them to come around the corner. When they pulled up, I noticed they had a little boy with them, and he's scared of the dark. I'm terrified at this point, but I have to act appropriately even more so because of this boy. I don't want to scare him. As I'm finishing my speech, I hear movement right behind me and say, Jesus fucking Christ, and spin around with my flashlight on instinct. Poor kid. I told them it was probably just a deer, and they're good to go across the bridge. That same night, the person stationed at the intersection this isn't like an in-town intersection. It's very rural. It's right next to a massive cornfield. He's Native American and was very in tune with his culture. He told me privately a few weeks later that he heard rustling in the cornfield and whatever was out there was whispering his name and trying to get him into the field. He was also without communication for those 20 minutes, but he wasn't in the woods and he could see a lot better than me. Another time, that same co-worker and myself were headed back on the front cart. We were a way ahead, so we stopped the cart in the middle of the high bridge. It sounds scary, I'm a bit afraid of heights, and this bridge has massive gaps between the planks that you could fit through. But after doing it so often, you do get used to it. It was a clear night, and we were watching the stars and making small talk. And all of a sudden, it goes silent. We're a hundred and so feet in the air above the woods. We can hear for miles. The dogs barking across the river two miles can be heard without even seeing the houses. We hear what sounds like a human mimicking a monkey noise, and we hear growling. He looks at me, completely seriously, and tells me in a stern tone that we needed to get out of there right now. I drive the fuck out of there and he moved states to Nevada shortly after this. A few other things happened here and there, and to co-workers as well. Each of my co-workers had at least one story. I'm only sharing mine in this post, otherwise it'd be too long. A few months go by, and it's late fall, around the middle of November. I drive through that park in town a lot when I just want to go for a drive. I had my dog, Fenrir, with me and it's around 2 a.m. I can't sleep, so I'm listening to a Melvin CD and driving leisurely through the park. As soon as I get past the entrance gates, I feel really uneasy and weird. I'm not easily scared. Going to that park at night makes me feel a primal fear. It's beyond fight or flight. I've never felt that way in my life anywhere else, ever. 
and I feel it every time I'm there. I'm driving through the park, and I've rolled the windows up a lot more. Fenrir can still poke his head out, but can't leap out. As I go deeper into the woods, I feel worse and worse. I decided not to turn around, because I'm already past the halfway point. Turning around would make me stay in the woods longer. I started speeding where there weren't turns I couldn't see around. I round the last corner, and what I saw made me have nightmares for months. There was a pale, skinny humanoid, tall and lanky, not quite human, fucking crawling on its hands and feet. But it was crawling fast, 20 miles per hour type of shit. We don't have bears here. The only animal that size are large humans and deer. That wasn't a deer. It went from my right, crossed the street, and went into the tree line. Fenrir saw it too. He doesn't bark at animals, not even at other dogs. He went ballistic. He was trying to force himself out of the small gap in the window, nearly foaming at the mouth and snarling. He never, ever acts like that. I'm a certified dog trainer, and I've raised him from birth. Most recently, I've become obsessed with this park. I've walked there at night from my camper to the park with Fenrir. I'll never do it again. I didn't see a figure this time. As I was entering the park, a massive owl flew by my head so close I could have smacked it mid-flight. This made me feel weird for some reason. As soon as I get into the park, I feel extremely weird, anxious, and nauseous. I walk a few hundred yards to the only street light in the entire park, and I turn around and face the woods. Fenrir and I stand there, frozen, for like ten minutes. The silence was deafening. Any time I heard anything, I'd jump. Finn was anxious as hell, too. He kept staring into a certain spot in the woods, a ways off. I swear, I saw eyes in there every once in a while. I built up the courage to walk out, and I haven't gone back since. It'll be interesting to see what happens at my job this year. I wanted to add that the county I live in is packed full of abandoned mines, hundreds of them. This is a story that pops back up in my mind from time to time. I've only told it to a few people, but I definitely feel like it deserves its place in here. It's for sure one of the scariest moments I've ever had as a child. Back when I was around 10 years old, my mom finally decided that it was time for her to start lessons for her driver's license. When she began taking lessons, she was struggling a lot. For that reason, my dad decided that he wanted to do some practice with her besides the official driving lessons with her instructor, just to make sure that she'd pass the upcoming test first try. My little brother and I were attending swimming lessons at this nearby university at the time. Behind a forested area near the university lays this huge student parking area surrounded by trees, which turned out to be basically empty every weekend. My dad saw the opportunity to take my mom here to drive around for a bit and brought my little brother and I with them, since we were too young to stay home alone. We brought a football with us. When we arrived at the parking lot later on in the evening, my parents began their practice. My little brother and I quickly got bored though, and we asked if we could go over to this little grass field on the side of the parking lot to play some football. My parents let us, since they'd always be able to keep their eyes on us whilst driving around. After playing for some time, my parents ended up driving around in the other end of the parking lot. They were approximately three to four hundred meters away from my brother and I. Suddenly, this white Toyota pulls into the parking lot. We were playing almost right at the entrance slash exit. The car turns around and stops on my side with the vehicle facing the exit. 
The driver rolls down his windows and presents himself as Thomas. He looked friendly, was good looking and young. I would guess around 30 years old. This is where things started to get weird. On the passenger seat was a woman covering her face with a newspaper. All I could see was long blonde hair and on the back seat was a baby sat in a baby chair. Thomas immediately states that he's from the police and that we have to get in the car immediately as he has to talk to us. My brother actually took two steps towards the vehicle, but I stuck my arm in front of his chest as I was sensing something was off. The woman was still covering her face at this point, not saying a word. Thomas then raised his voice and told us once again to get into the car or else he'd have to come out and get us. My brother and I froze out of fear. Suddenly, the woman put down the newspaper, showed her face, and told us in the most calm motherly voice to just listen to the man. The woman looked young, pretty, and like a person who wouldn't hurt a fly. At this moment, I began screaming as loud as I could. What we hadn't seen at that point was that my dad was already running as fast as he could towards us. He was coming from behind the vehicle, so we didn't see it. My parents didn't have time to drive to us since the road down the parking lot was twisted all the way. When my dad heard my scream, he started yelling as loud as he could. Hey, who the fuck are you? Get the fuck away from my children. As soon as Thomas heard my dad and realized my brother and I weren't alone, he threw his car into gear and took off as fast as he could. He most definitely looked like a person who shot himself when he saw my dad. My dad was furious and told my brother and I to hurry up back to the car. He didn't even think about calling the police at that point. He wanted to beat the guy up himself. That resulted in us driving around for the next hour trying to find him before my dad cooled down and decided that he should probably just call the police. We never found out who these people were, but this episode taught me to never judge a book by its cover. People can be the most friendly looking people in the world and still wish evil upon you or the ones you love. I'm not sure what these people would have done to us. I'm sure about one thing though, they definitely weren't from the police. I live in a small town in North Italy, a valley between our typical old mountains. So just behind my home, lots of hikes start. I've always lived here, and I like the mountains. Plus, I'm trying to get into shape so the terrain is ideal, especially because I'm really familiar with it. So, last summer, I was walking my usual route when I thought I could try to have a short hike before sunset. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Italian ground, but there aren't the big spaces and long distances typical of the US, I imagine. I was with my dog, a well-trained Spitz, good company with good instincts that I trust. He's a working dog more than a pet, despite his size. So we took the path and started making our way up. It was nice and relaxed, but we had to be active and a bit more quick, as we didn't have too much light left. I just figured that if light went low, I'd just turn around and head home. There were no chances of getting lost. The woods immediately engulf us. They are pretty dense, but it's normal. Not even 15 minutes of walking and I'm paralyzed with this overwhelming sense of dread. The woods are completely silent. My skin crawls just thinking about it. Even my dog stops and becomes anxious. I couldn't understand what was scaring me so much in the sudden silence. I couldn't move a muscle. I've read The Gift of Fear, and the only time I didn't listen to my guts, I lost my spleen in an accident. So wide-eyed and hyper-alert, I forced myself to move and noped out of there. It was like my brain was screaming, 
If you stay here, you'll die. Walking back, I couldn't stop the urge to continuously look behind me. At some point, I was practically running, and I kept thinking that if I sprained an ankle, I would die. The dog seemed relieved when we had turned back, and he kept looking behind too. When we finally made it out of the woods and back to the road, I felt a wave of relief and ran all the way back home with the adrenaline that I had. To this day, I don't know what happened, but I haven't gone back. So this isn't something that I've witnessed. I was told this story by one of the men who allegedly saw it. For context, this guy had run with some questionable crowds and did what jobs he had to to make money at times, if you get my drift. This guy has lots of stories. I mostly consider this a tall tale, but there is still enough of it that makes me wonder, what if? According to Zed, he had been finishing up some work down in Louisiana back in the late 1990s with his buddy and had a few days to kill, namely to get some fishing and hunting in, albeit out of season. One of the guys they had worked with gave them directions to a spot way back in the swamps and marshes that they could use without risking being caught by fish and game agents. He said one of the best things about this spot was there were, oddly enough, never any alligators there. A bit of a red flag, that one. Anyways, one fine morning, they set out in their boat before the sun was up, navigating their way through the swamps. From what he described, this was a section that was close to the Mississippi border, routes used by smugglers to move various products across state lines. They finally arrived at the spot after a few hours and some detours, they turned off the motor on their boat and started fishing. The trees were just thick enough to prevent you from being seen from overhead, and they were essentially in a huge inlet that was somewhat sheltered from the rest of the bayou, and they had the start of solid land along the two sides of it. By solid land, that also meant you had to walk across 10 to 15 feet of muck that could suck your boots off before you got to solid ground. So according to Zed, the day was progressing and fishing wasn't going great, but they still had beer, so they weren't inclined to go anywhere. They both noted that, as the guy had said, there were no alligators. Normally you could spot them lurking around or sunning themselves, but they were just utterly gone from the spot, as were most of the big fish it seemed. It was at this point they observed a herd of feral hogs emerge from the undergrowth on one side of the lagoon and make their way to the muck that was described before. They then commenced to start rolling and rooting in it to their heart's content. Zed and his buddy slowly angled their boat closer as they had sidearms with them and certainly had no issue with getting wild pork instead of fish if the opportunity was there. The hogs were leery, but not afraid, keeping the humans in their line of sight as they frolicked. Zed saw they had no real way to get to a hog if they shot it there, so they just floated along and watched for a good opportunity. But instead, they saw something else entirely. According to Zed, that's when they saw the mud start to move. He knew instantly it wasn't an alligator as an alligator would be flailing around in the mud, trying to reach the hogs. And whatever this thing was, it was covered in mud. The only way he could describe it was something was pushing its way through the muck, like an almost submerged bulldozer, creeping up on the pigs. They watched as it slowly approached a cluster of hogs who had noticed the movement, but seemed more curious about what it was than afraid. One of them, a pig that Zed estimated was between 150 to 175 pounds, was the furthest out in the muck, and made the mistake of attempting to sniff at whatever the intruder was. Zed said that quicker than they could react, something lunged out from the thing, 
and attached to the pig's head and face. As the pig thrashed, then tried to jump back, letting out the most blood-curdling scream they'd ever heard, the thing was hauled partially out of the muck and came into better view. Zed realized it was an alligator snapping turtle of proportions he'd never heard of. He's seen the one they keep at Bass Pro Shop that got big enough that it cracked its tank and had to get a new one, and he said that was like comparing a chihuahua to a pit bull. It was still partially obscured by the muck that was covering it, but Zed swore its shell had to be at least the size of the hood from a Volkswagen Beetle. His best guess on its weight was it was well over 500 pounds, and it was now backing up into deeper water, dragging the pig with it. Zed said from what they could see, the turtle's head was so big that it was able to fit its jaws partially around the pig's skull, and its beak was now essentially acting as a meat hook. Apparently it was about a 30 second fight to drag the pig out into the lagoon, but Zed said it was clear the pig never had a chance. The turtle dragged it out into the water, and the pig made one last desperate attempt to break free. Apparently hearing something screaming underwater one last time is as unnerving as you'd imagine, and Hollywood doesn't get the sound right. It then just went absolutely quiet after that. According to Zed, he and his buddy sat there for a minute, processing what they just seen, and except for the froth on top of the water and the stirred up mud, there was no sign anything had just happened. The other hogs had fled as soon as their comrade was attacked, and except for some bugs, it was almost completely silent. They couldn't say why, but Zed said they booked it out of there that something was off, and it felt wrong to be there. It wasn't like they could go to fish and game and describe what they saw, but they did fill in their acquaintances on why there were no alligators in that area. As far as Zed knew, nobody else had ever seen this colossal turtle and came forward to talk about it, but Zed said that it was big enough that if it caught a person unaware, it could easily overpower and kill a human the same way it did to that pig. Again, this is how the story was told to me. It's not my story, and I'm inclined to mostly believe it's a tall tale or an exaggerated one, but it does highlight that you don't need something as fanciful as a skunk ape or Bigfoot to be nervous about what might be lurking out of sight. This just happened about 15 minutes ago, and it's one of the weirdest encounters that I've ever had. My family and I were sitting in our living room, watching TV after dinner. All of a sudden, there's an unexpected knock at the front door. I go to open it, and there are three young teens, sophomores in high school, that I don't know. They tell me that a few guys are following them, and they needed to look like they knew someone. I told them immediately to come inside to evade the people following them. The teens told me it was three younger boys, probably 8th grade, that had been following them as they walked about a mile from a gas station nearby to my neighborhood. I went outside to try and see if I could see the boys, and sure enough, they were just down the street. When I stepped outside, they yelled, Lacey, is that you? I didn't answer. But I went inside and asked if any of the girls seeking refuge were named Lacey. None were. My dad then went outside to tell the boys to move along, and they got really mouthy and rude. Eventually, they went up the street and out of sight. However, they came back down a few minutes later, so I opened the door and yelled for them to leave, but they argued with me and wouldn't go anywhere. My dad went back outside, and a neighbor heard the yelling and came to see what was happening. 
with the threat of two grown men, the boys finally left. Not without some lip, though. I then drove the three teens back to one of their houses so they could evade the boys and get back home safely. Something was really weird about the interactions with the young boys. I don't know what they were looking to do, or if they were just looking for trouble, but something just didn't sit right with me. I'm just glad the three teens felt my house was a safe place to go. I don't know what it was, but it scared the fuck out of me. Basically, I was an 18-year-old who smoked weed in my car because my parents were strict as fuck. I had smoked for years, so I knew what the effects were. And yes, smoking and driving is bad, but you tell that to an 18-year-old. Anyway, I went to a local spot which was near my house in suburbia, but up a really long hill. It was a lookout on a hill in a remote area. The only way you'd get there is by car. It was the best place to smoke because it was remote. Anyway, I get there and there are no cars. It's late at night and dark. I put on some music and set up my bong. I smoked a few bowls and sat the bong down in my center console and I texted a friend saying that I would meet him in an hour to hang out. I sat there looking into the darkness and you could see the sky as well from where I was sitting. It seemed very peaceful all alone. Next thing I know, I hear a stick crack about three meters from my car, like someone had stepped on it. I flicked my lights on so I could see, and there was nothing. I freaked out a bit, but I eventually calmed down and took another hit. Just as I went to pack another bowl, I heard another stick crack but this time it sounded closer. I flicked the lights on again, but there was nothing. That's when I looked towards the night sky, and I see a human-looking silhouette stand up. It was unmistakable. Someone or something had been watching me for the past 30 minutes. I started the car, slammed it into reverse, and noped out of there. As I went down the hill, I remember the bong sitting there, I needed to pack it away, but it was loaded. I stopped at the start of a fire trail. I figured why waste good weed and went to finish what I'd packed. And just as I lit it up, I heard the gate behind my car rattle. Then I heard a noise on the back of my car. Again I noped out of there as fast as I could, packing the bong up as I sped down this hill. I got to my friend's house and told him what had happened. My theory now is that some kids did walk up that hill at night, saw me pull in, and watched me smoke for 30 minutes, then maybe decided to approach me. The sound at the gate was probably a possum. Either way, it haunts me to this day. It started with my three-year-old son having a seizure. Something told me to get up in the middle of the night to check on him. He was having a full-blown grand mal seizure. Up to this point, he was in perfect health. Needless to say, I freaked out. After a visit to a naval hospital in Jacksonville, Florida, my husband was a Marine. I was told he needed to be seen at an MRI clinic in Gainesville, Florida. We had just moved to Florida a few months prior, and I didn't know a soul. I was terrified about the upcoming appointments, as it was scheduled for 7.30 a.m., and I had absolutely no idea how to get there. I told the NAS doctor about my fear, and his advice was to buy a map. There were no cell phones or GPS back then. So I pack up my two sons and head out at 3.30 a.m., I planned to stop at a gas station and either buy a map or ask someone if they knew the way to the Naval Hospital Gainesville MRI clinic. It's about 4.15am at this point, and I'm white-knuckling it on a dark road to Gainesville. I'm in the right lane, 
when suddenly a car is to the left of me. The passenger window is down, and an elderly male is motioning me to roll down my window. The interior to the car is lit, and I notice he's looking at something like a metal notepad. It was weird. He then states, You go into the MRI clinic. Follow me, please. At this point, I'm thinking he's going to lead me down a deserted road and do God knows what to me. We had stopped at two red lights. I wanted to ask him how he knew where I was going. He didn't ask. He knew. But I was too frightened to get out of the car. So I follow him. About 30 minutes later, he came to a stop and pointed to the building. He led me right to it. I looked at the building and then back towards the car. I wanted to get out and thank this kind stranger. Only there was no one there. No car. No taillights from a distant car. Nothing. I can remember this like it was yesterday. I'm not religious, but the only thing that makes sense about this was that it was a guardian angel. My son was diagnosed with a type of epilepsy which he outgrew in his teens. I did ask the doctor in Jacksonville if he sent someone to help me. He just left. Back when I was 16, I was walking in a heavily wooded area near St. Louis, Missouri, a largely undeveloped plot of land that was known for a large population of deer. The snow and ice had been unusually heavy that winter, so as April came around, it continued to thaw and rain a lot. Very dreary, overcast day, lots of fallen trees and mud. I noticed one tree had fallen in the middle of the path and I didn't focus on it too much until I saw something dangling inches from my face. It was a dead deer, a young buck hanging from the fallen tree in between the two main branches. The hooves had been dangling inches from my face because of how zoned out I was, not processing anything because of the sense of security I felt in those woods. This was private property owned by the school I was attending, and hunting was strictly prohibited because there were neighbors nearby. More importantly, who walked hundreds of miles into the woods and hung up the carcass in that way in the middle of a rainstorm? School sent its security out. They figured it was illegal bow hunting, but the deer was never recovered. So at first, they didn't believe my story until weeks later, when several female deer were found laying in a nearby open field, all sprawled out in bizarre poses, clearly manipulated after they died. No signs of post-mortem cuts, scavenging from coyotes, or decay. They were also too far away from the road to be roadkill, but there could have been an attempt by someone to hide that they were hunting without license or permission. It's still very strange, and I haven't seen anything like it since, and I live in Florida, where weird stuff happens all the time in national parks and wetlands. One weekend, I was coming back home to my dorm after spending the weekend at my dad's house when I remembered I didn't have milk. So I decided to stop at this little gas station next to campus. The second I walked inside, my spidey sense tingled. There was a man, probably in his fifties, who locked on me immediately, as in completely unbashedly stared at me from the moment I walked in. I swear... It could only have been creepier if he'd licked his lips, but I saw he was in line to check out, so I figured I'd duck into the ladies' room and he'd be gone by the time I was out. No. When I came out of the restroom, he'd gone out of line and was stalking around the aisles, still watching me as he walked back up to the checkout. I got my milk and was a couple people behind him in line, trying not to freak out. 
Then, when he checked out, he took his bag, walked out, and stood next to the exit door, still watching me. Thank God for the clerk, who noticed what was going on and said, Do you want to stay in here for a while? I'm sure I was shaking like a leaf when I nodded, but fortunately, there was no one behind me. So, the clerk let me stay there and chat until the guy finally got into his truck and drove off. That was almost 15 years ago, but to this day, I believe that guy meant me harm. I've never been so freaked out in my life. Many years ago, a friend and I decided to visit our mutual friend at her university and spend the weekend with her. We had extremely detailed directions to follow, and we were told the trip should take about three hours. While nothing went wrong on our drive, it seemed to take forever. I don't remember exactly at what point the woods started, but I do remember traveling through these woods for a long time, perhaps an hour. We were already well past the three-hour time frame my friend had given us by the time we left the woods. When we finally reached my friend's college town, it was nearly four and a half hours since we left. We didn't get lost. We never hit traffic or stopped for more than a few minutes, but we quickly forgot about it since we were happy to spend the weekend with our friend. When the trip back was a little over three hours, we thought it was weird but didn't think much of it at the time. It wasn't until my next trip to visit that I realized something had been strange. I spent that whole next trip waiting for the long path through the woods that we'd been on the first time, but they never appeared. Following the same directions as the first time, the entire trip took me about three hours, as did every other trip I made out there in the following years. I don't know what happened, and I've never been able to replicate it. I still wonder what happened, and where we really were when passing through those woods. I've met a guy who had been traveling Australia with a couple of friends hitchhiking around as many of us had done. One of his friends told him they were near his distant uncle's house, whom he'd never met before. He got a phone number from a family member, and as they'd hoped, the uncle offered them a place to stay. He picked them up in town and drove them out to his rural property way out in the bush. They said he seemed like a pretty normal guy, friendly and cheery. When it was time to set up a place to sleep, the uncle took them to a closet that was totally full of sleeping bags and bedrolls. They didn't think much of it at the time, and all grabbed a kit and set up on the living room floor. They stayed a couple of days, and nothing out of the ordinary happened. And afterwards, the uncle drove them to the bus station, and they continued on their way. About a year later, that man was arrested and charged with several counts of murder. He was the man who was picking up young hitchhiking backpackers and slaughtering them. The guy who told me this story was 100% certain that he'd slept in the sleeping bag of one of his victims. In my spare time, my friends and I go and visit abandoned places around town, and after having exhausted all of the most interesting ones, we regularly met up at our favorite one. It was a completely abandoned bank, left behind in the late 1990s, as a different headquarters was found for it. It was one of the coolest buildings in my opinion, because from the roof, one could get a stunning view of my hometown. It was relatively easy getting in. The only real issue was not getting spotted because the building was regularly patrolled by security and armed police. 
In addition to all of that, the only entrance known to us at the time was right next to a busy street. On the evening of the last day of 2019, together with my two best friends, Paul and Matt, I decided to have one last look inside before the end of the year. The weather was damp and there was a thick fog, but we weren't too worried because it's common for this to occur in the area where we live. As we approached the entrance, we couldn't help but notice a homeless guy with a long beard following us from behind. Initially, we didn't even question why we were being followed as he was quite far from us and in the neighborhood we were in, occurrences like that were common and harmless, so we decided to enter the bank nonetheless. In order to stay safe, we always went in one at a time. Matt went in first while Paul and I waited for him outside, checking that no police or suspicious people were around. While we were waiting, the homeless man approached us and stopped right next to us. There was a moment of silence to start with, but then, after the man had taken a sip from what I assumed was a flask of some sort of liquor, he asked us, whilst pointing at Matt, who was on the other side of the gate, Is that your friend? His voice was deep and growling and extremely intimidating. Paul replied, Yeah, he just needed to use the toilet urgently, which in hindsight was the worst possible excuse one could have come up with. As he said that, Matt jumped over the fence again and joined us, seeing the unusual encounter we had made. The man told us, No worries, guys. I'm an illegal one, too. He then proceeded to jump over the gate and entered the building. We watched him walk towards the main door until he had completely disappeared in the fog. At this point, there was again another awkward moment of silence. We didn't know what to do. The building was so big, there was always a fear of getting lost. And this, coupled with the encounter we had just had, made some of us terrified of entering the building. Paul was too scared to enter the bank, so he left. Matt and I walked around there for an hour until we saw what we thought was the same homeless guy as before leaving the building. We still had so many questions. Like, who was that man? Was he armed? Why did he say he was an illegal one? We were pretty anxious and still didn't know if we actually wanted to go in. But a mix of the cold and our unstoppable will to just hang out on the last day of the year made us want to forget about that man and just go in. We then called another friend of ours who lived right around the corner from the bank. His name was Phil. He agreed to join us on our adventure. So without thinking twice, in we went. We didn't have much time left before dark, so we went through the drill quicker than usual. After entering the actual building, we told Phil about what had happened. He was the oldest among us and reassured us by telling us not to worry about it too much. He's probably just a poor guy looking for a warm place to sleep. I don't think he's ill-intentioned, Phil said. Nevertheless, we kept our guard higher than usual. We were still in a massive abandoned bank after all. As we progressed up the floors, we started calming down to the point where we had almost forgotten about the encounter we had previously made. Once we reached the top floor, we decided to take some pictures. The view from up there was absolutely stunning. I don't think I'll ever see my city as I saw it that evening. The setting sun created a beautiful red and orange light, which created a picturesque background to the snow-covered mountains and the brutalist buildings surrounding the town. Although we were enjoying the beautiful light and view, we knew that night was approaching, and as you might imagine, it's never pleasant being in an abandoned building in the dark. We were planning on staying there for just another half hour, until Phil and I heard the only thing you never want to hear in a completely empty building. The screech of a rusty door and a violent slam following it. Phil and I both turned around to face one another. I then stuttered. Did you hear that? 
Bill nodded, so we immediately rushed to the nearest staircase. I guess that Phil's and my survival instincts must have kicked in at that point, because we just ran to the door without even warning Matt, who was still taking pictures of the beautiful scenery and hadn't even realized what was going on. Luckily, he decided to follow us. It turns out that he hadn't even heard the door slam behind our backs. I don't think I've ever run so fast in my entire life. While heading towards the stairs, I saw, partly hidden in the darkness, what looked like the silhouette of a man. I never told this to my friends, but it looked like he was holding a metal rod or some sort of elongated, shiny debris. When we reached the fifth floor, we heard from a few floors above us a very deep, maniacal scream, followed by a long series of swear words and blasphemies. We continued running down the stairs as fast as we could, and when we finally reached the ground floor, we heard that voice one last time. It was screaming in Italian, Leave, 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 go away. I'm glad I was fit enough to run down nine stories and out of the building, and I don't dare to think of what could have happened to us if Phil and I didn't notice the suspicious sounds. I know for a fact that if I somehow got killed, the building is so big that my body would probably have never been found. So, this was a few years ago. A friend and I took up the hobby of exploring abandoned buildings and urban exploring in our free time because we just found it to be fun and interesting. We're from Long Island, New York, where MS-13, the deadliest street gang in America, mainly operates out of some of the towns here. I was browsing around the internet for nearby places to explore for fun when I came around to the Pilgrim State Psychiatric Center in Brentwood, New York. We didn't put much thought into it and just went. We parked in a parking lot a good distance away and started to walk through the woods to get there. I had done this before with other places and I had never had this strange feeling before. Just the walk over, I felt uneasy like never before. There was trash everywhere and dirt mounds that seemed like they could have been dug up. We finally came around to the building, which was conveniently easy to enter. When we entered, we were greeted by dirty mattresses that seemed to have been placed there for a reason. We didn't talk to each other about how we felt because we didn't want to seem like wimps. We went through the entire building, seeing many mattresses and old shoes that looked to have been people's. We got up to the top, and of course it had just gotten dark out and we had a long walk back once we get out. We go back to the bottom of the building and lost our way. The only way out was walking over a plank over an abyss, but that isn't the bad part. We crawl out through a window and start walking along the road to get back to my car. Two cops see us while they're driving and come over to talk to us. One of them says to us, you really shouldn't be going in there after dark and they let us go. We laughed it off and got back to the car. My friend called his cousin to tell him about what we did. He told us that MS-13 operates out of there and that we're lucky to be alive. I look up Pilgrim State Murder and sure as hell, I see that multiple teens have been murdered there and also in the woods where we walked through initially. The cops had dug and searched the woods before to find missing teenagers, so I connected the dots between that and the mounds I saw. I went to bed that night, shaking about the thought that I could have been killed for entering their territory. If you want, you can look up Pilgrim State MS-13 Brentwood or something. So, to MS-13, please, let's not meet.
All right. Well, it's a terribly slow day at work, so I'll give you a story. This takes place a little over a year ago, some weekday around midnight in central Ohio. I want to preface this by saying I'm not particularly religious, nor do I necessarily believe in ghosts or the supernatural. But something weird happened that night that I can't explain. This story is 100% true, except for some certain details that have been changed to keep some element of anonymity. So let's call it a Wednesday, as I don't quite remember what day it was. It was around 5 p.m. A friend tells me about an abandoned building her friend showed her the day before, and she asks if I want to check it out sometime. Of course I do, but being the curious soul that I am, I wanted to go that night, whereas she could not. I ask a few other friends to make the journey with me, and they all decline, either because they aren't into the whole B&D and trespassing thing, or they're otherwise busy. I decide to go alone. This isn't something I usually do, as I have a few close friends who are just as experienced as I am in urbex, and the three of us are an excellent team when it comes to stuff like this. I've gone to places alone before, but never with this little research done on the area. I couldn't find anything on the internet about this place. I decided to say fuck it and go as I'm not one to back down from an opportunity like this. So I grab my bag, flashlight, camera, and I'm on my way. I tell someone exactly where I'll be in case something happens, and to call the police if I stop responding after a few hours. I arrive about a mile from the location and start my journey. Most of it is woods and creeks, but the last bit is a dilapidated parking lot. I get to the lot and see not one, but two buildings to explore. This is turning out better than expected. I choose to go into the building on the left, as it looks more easily accessible, and I start looking for a way in. Around the back, I find some metal stairs that have been overgrown, and look like they're close to collapsing. I decide to take my chances and slowly climb them, keeping my eyes on each step to make sure I'm not going to fall through or anything. I climb the stairs just fine and get to the second floor. The door is closed, but opens just fine. There aren't any padlocks or anything. I'm in. Looking around with my flashlight, this place is in better shape than a lot of abandoned buildings around my location. Part of the roof has been caved in from a tree falling, but everything else looks pretty good. I walk around the entrance room a bit more and realize where I am. There are note cards all over the floor with basic information on people. First and last names, addresses, DOBs, diagnosis code, and inpatient or outpatient with a check next to one. I'm in a psychiatrist's office. Nice. I love these kinds of places, and insane asylums are my favorite places to explore. I have a seat and look through some of the patient cards. I look up diagnosis codes and try to get a profile of who the person was. No particular reason, just interesting stuff. After a little while of this, I stand up and continue my journey. Now, the way this building is set up is basically a giant letter I with the entrance stairs used at the bottom and a boarded up main entrance in the center. The only set of stairs to the first floor are at the top of the eye. I look around some of the second floor room and I don't really see much. It's mostly empty offices with a chair or a lamp in the room. I do, however, find a room that I assume was for children to play in while their parents were seeing a psychiatrist. It had a sandbox and some toys laying around but I noticed someone took some of the sand and drew a pentagram on the floor with it. I chuckled, and after seeing everything I needed to see on the second floor, I go down to the first floor. The stairs are steep and winding, but very sturdy. I check the door to make sure it won't lock behind me and make my way down. The first floor is basically just a long hallway with rooms along one side and a reception area on the other. 
I start checking out the rooms on the right side. After a few interesting rooms, a break room, kitchen, storage closet with Christmas stuff inside, I come across this office with something interesting on the desk. Before getting to that, I want to pose a question. Why does every abandoned building have Christmas stuff in it? Like seriously, 90% of the buildings I've been to have fake trees, wreaths, garlands, or something like that. What gives? Anyway, back to the story. So, on the desk in this office is a set of post-it notes. On these notes are messages that make me feel a little uneasy. They go like this. He is planning on letting the hostage out. 4.30. Do we have staff accountability yet? 4.35. Can Officer John escort Jane out of the room? 4.42. As soon as I see this, I snap a picture. I take one on my phone too, so I can send it to a friend. This is where things get weird. As soon as I take the picture on my phone, the entire building starts shaking violently. My first thought was, earthquake. Now, I'm not speaking from experience, but I have to assume an old, dilapidated building isn't the type of place you want to be during an earthquake. So I start to make my way back out, only this time, rather briskly. As I get upstairs, I notice the door I propped open to keep from locking me down there was now only slightly ajar. The small metal piece I propped it open with was nowhere to be seen, although I didn't look very hard. As I'm walking slash jogging my way out through this gyrating building, I notice that every door I had opened upstairs was now closed tight. What the hell was someone fucking with me? I didn't want to stick around and find out. As I was leaving the larger room I entered through, I noticed the door I came in was shut. I pulled on it, but nothing. The thing wouldn't open. Now, I'm pretty calm under pressure, but this was beginning to be too much. I was starting to freak out a bit. I made the quick decision to force my way out. Typically, I hate doing any damage to a building I'm exploring and usually try to avoid it whenever possible. But this was a special case. I want it out of there. Kick the door down. I've done it before, but this door didn't seem like it was going anywhere. It opens the other way and was very sturdy. I guess I'm kicking out the press board covering the window next to it, I thought to myself. Luckily these windows were huge and low enough where I could get a foot on the wood. Two kicks and the wood gives out. The building is still shaking so I made a hasty getaway down the stairs. Then, the part that still spooks me. As soon as my feet hit the ground from the last step, the building stopped shaking completely. Everything around me was silent. I must have been going crazy. I know what I felt, and I know what I saw. I got out of there and didn't look back. A few weeks later, my crew freed up and wanted me to show them the place, even after I told them this story. Oddly enough, every other time I've been there, nothing out of the ordinary has happened. I'm not sure what happened or why, and I'm not one to believe it was a ghost or anything, but I'd be lying if I said it didn't shake me up a bit. Was it just a well-timed earthquake? Possibly but I heard nothing about it on the news the next day, and nobody else said they felt or heard anything. Any insight on this, whether it be spiritual, geological, or anything really, would be really wonderful to know. Well, that's just one of my many stories, and actually the most recent. Let me know if you want any more. There was a huge old house built in 1915 and converted into apartments for World War I soldiers before they went overseas. I rented one apartment, about a thousand square foot, and the rest of the house was empty rooms and a giant staircase. 
As soon as I moved in, I met the next-door neighbor, Rebecca, who, about 30 seconds into the conversation, asked me if I knew the house was haunted. I laughed it off, but she insisted it wasn't safe. I wasn't worried. I moved in, cleaned out a lot of junk, and fixed the place up as well as I could. Over the next few months, Rebecca and I ran into each other here and there, and each time she added to the story. Apparently there was an old lady who lived in the apartment before me who never left, never opened the windows, and never cleaned. She died in the apartment, and there was an estate sale to get rid of some of her stuff. Rebecca told me during the estate sale she'd gone into the basement and regretted it. About a week later, I decided to go check out the basement, I think partly to prove to myself I wasn't concerned. I was also curious. I'm not superstitious, and I don't believe in ghosts, but the occult is interesting to me. As soon as I stepped in the basement, I was creeped out. It smelled musty, but not like I've ever smelled before. Along the steps, there were burned down candles that made bluish gray wax puddles. The basement itself had two huge water heater tanks, also covered in wax, and an empty concrete floor behind the tanks that had nasty looking towels around and more candles. Bizarre, but not haunted. At this point, I've lived in the apartment by myself for about three months without any problem. My car got broken into one night, but that wasn't surprising given the neighborhood. Nothing strange had happened until the night I checked the basement. At 4 a.m., I bolted awake because I heard something in my room. This was odd for me because I sleep like a dead man. I sat in bed for a minute, heard nothing, and went back to sleep. Around 6 a.m., I had a night terror. I heard the noise again and woke up, but this time had sleep paralysis. I saw a pitch black figure walk into my room and stop just inside the doorway. At this point, I think it's a robber, and I start trying to ask what he wants, but I can't speak or move. Nothing like this had ever happened to me before, and I was terrified. After the longest two to three minutes of my life, I willed myself out of sleep, and the whole atmosphere changed. No one was there. Nothing was out of place. No locks were broken. Nothing. I quickly got ready and showed up at work two hours before it opened. Over the next few weeks, I would hear the sound again here and there. It was a scratching and thumping sound, always very early in the morning. As soon as I would wake up, it would stop. Then one morning, it was especially loud. It was 5 a.m. and still dark outside. I heard it just behind the headboard of my bed. This time I made sure I was totally awake. I lay perfectly still and didn't even breathe, and I heard it again, now fully awake. There was definitely something in my room. After the sleep paralysis slash imaginary robber episode, I had bought a kid's baseball bat and sat it next to my bed for self-defense. I couldn't afford a firearm. I picked up the bat and slid out of bed. Every minute or so, I would hear the rustling, scratching, slash thumping noise. It was in my closet. I stood outside the door, and my heart was pounding at this point. All the stories of the place being haunted, the creepy basement, the sleep paralysis episode, the weird early morning noises, all of it had built up in my mind and led to this moment. I was about to do battle with some evil force. I threw the door open and swung into the darkness, hitting nothing. I beat my clothes like a madman, but there was nothing in there. Then I heard a little scurry on the floor and saw something jump into one of my shoes. Upon closer inspection, it was a baby squirrel. I went outside later and found a hole in the roof. There was a family of squirrels living in my ceiling that was very active in the early morning, and one of the babies had somehow managed to find its way into my closet to scare the hell out of me. The place wasn't haunted, it was just squirrels.
Okay, this is an interesting story. Fairly close to the house I grew up in sits an abandoned elementary school. It hadn't been in operation since 1967. In 2007, my band was looking for a location to take photos, and I let them know about the school, and everyone was intrigued. We planned a trip to scope out the place and see what it has to offer. I'd never been in the school before, I'd only ever heard about it. None of us knew what to expect. When we got there, the place was overrun with ivy and wildlife. Since the front door was locked, we had to climb in through a back window that was broken. We all got inside and began to spread out to examine the area. Nothing really creepy, just an old building that had seen its fair share of squatters and garbage dumpers. There were about six classrooms altogether. Some were in better shape than others. One room had a four foot wide, three foot tall pile of old roller skates. We thought that was odd. There was an old nurse's station with a medicine cabinet that had very old ointment in it. Sure, there were a few cat skeletons and dead birds, but we weren't bothered by it. We even saw two feral kittens running around and trying to avoid us. We were pretty satisfied with the trip and were about to leave when we found a room that none of us came across yet. It looked like another classroom, but this one had a small door inside. It was about half the size of a normal door. We opened it and were presented with stairs going down into a dark area. We had phones and flashlights and we soon found out that it was the boiler room. Along with the standard stuff you'd find in a boiler room, there was a long corridor that seemed like it went on forever. At the end of it was nothing, just a wall, nothing else. So we decided to leave since we saw what we came to see. Right as we left the boiler room, I saw a small box on top of a plastic barrel. I opened the box, and inside was an incredibly old Polaroid camera. I thought it was cool, and I hung on to it. I was so excited about the find that I didn't realize that I'd left the door to the boiler room open. We closed up the doors to the school to make it look like we didn't disturb anything. We got back into the van and were about to leave when I took the camera and pointed it at my guitarist, Pete, who was driving, and I pretended to snap a picture. Only, it wasn't pretend. Not only did the flash go off, but an old Polaroid picture slowly slid out of the camera. We were shocked, to say the least. Amazed by what had just happened, we decided to take a picture of the front of the school from the van. Everything seemed fine, until the next day when we went back to take the photos. We had brought a couple of other people with us this time. While we were giving them the tour, we decided to show them the boiler room. When we arrived at the front of the small door, we were presented with a horrible sight. The two kittens, who were alive and well the day before, were dead right in front of the door. The door that I had left open. But they weren't just dead. They were rotting and crawling with maggots. The smell. I'll never get that sight out of my head. However, we didn't let that stop us. We proceeded to take our photos and did our thing. Then we remembered the camera. We showed the new people the camera, and they were amazed that it still worked, and that it still had working film. We showed them the photos that we took with it. Everything was alright, until we got to the photo of the school. We had closed up the school. I know we did. We had to so that no one would be suspicious and prevent us from visiting again. When we looked at the photo of the school again, the front door to the school was open, wide open. We just looked at the picture with our mouths open. I couldn't believe it. It seemed so unreal that I still have trouble believing it. Being the skeptic that I am, I decided to recreate the photo by taking another picture with the camera from the same vantage point. This time, the doors were closed. I can't explain anything that happened. 
It still creeps me out to this day to think about it. My dad has a house in the mountains of upstate New York. He bought it in the early 2000s. We still lived in the suburbs of Westchester, so we would go up and stay at this house on the weekends while my dad did his best to fix it up. When I was little, I was into paintball and from the city, so I was always shooting up things in the woods. Next to my dad's house in the woods was this house that was falling apart. I could see it in the distance from my bedroom window, and it always gave me the creeps. Half of the ceiling was caved in, and it was fully furnished. An old Ford Fairlane still in the driveway. Everything was completely rotting away. One time my cousin came up that weekend. We took the paintball guns and went out to shoot up the woods as usual. We walked over to the old decrepit house and thought it would be fun to shoot out all the windows. So we did. It was fun. We continued to find other things to shoot up and went back inside to play Grand Theft Auto 3. The next weekend I went up, but didn't visit the abandoned house. The weekend after that, my cousin came up with us again, and we went out with the paintball guns. We walked towards the old house, and all the windows weren't broken anymore. They were still full of cobwebs and pollen. My cousin and I were confused as hell, so we shot them out again. We stopped going up for a couple of months after that, and by that time, the house had been demolished. I still can't explain how the windows either fixed themselves, or it's like it never happened. When I've talked to people about it, they've suggested maybe the owner had replaced them, but as I said, they were full of cobwebs, and who would replace windows to a house with no ceiling? A group of my friends and I explored an abandoned asylum a couple of years ago in the Oklahoma City metro. It was very unsafe at night for silly college freshmen like ourselves. The first experience we had was all of us taking our merry time, enjoying the darkness, and generally fucking around. You have to come in through a broken window, and we were all gathered at the window just being dumb when we hear loud echoing footsteps down the hall, running towards us. We all did that. Who the heck isn't here? Who's messing with us? Look, and turn around after realizing we were all present, and none of us are sprinting down a dark abandoned hallway, and we booted it out of there. The second time, we could hear a group of people messing with us, jumping from around corners and such, but they never got too close. We assumed it was an animal at first, but got brave, and we realized it was a person. We managed to catch them, and after staring at a collection of seemingly drugged up twenty-somethings who begged us for cans of paint and cigarettes, we got the not-so-good vibes, finally, you say, and we tried to leave. The leader of the haunted asylum cronies asked if we had jewelry, which we denied. He then said the creepiest thing I've heard in my life. I like jewelry. I take it off the girls here when they sleep. We fucking bolted. My friends and I discovered the opening tunnel to the sewer system this one summer in middle school. We started to go in there to smoke and relax away from the public. There was this one spot we liked that was dry and full of graffiti, so that was our spot, but it was pretty deep in there. One day we noticed the messages on the wall, and we knew it was fresh since we hadn't seen it before. We went back again and again without any further incident. One day, Myself and two others decided to skip school and go there to smoke and chill. We were there for like half an hour, and we just finished smoking a blunt, when we started hearing a faint voice burst into laughter. 
followed by other voices also bursting into laughter. We couldn't tell if it was coming from the entrance or from the deeper part of the tunnel. We stayed quiet and started hearing the laughter getting louder and more intense. One of my friends quickly went to the nearest manhole cover and started pushing up. My other friend joined him to help and they were able to open it. We crawled out of there onto a busy road and ran for our lives to the nearest apartment complex. A friend's neighbor's house that was across the street from him was a drug addict pad. The owner sold it and the new owner tore it down. The drug addicts moved out and it was empty for a good month or so. Before it was torn down, my buddy and I went snooping around the lot. We looked through the windows and we could see a lot of personal items, furniture, and decorations that were still there. The place was trashed. We found that the back door was open. We went in, the floors bowed to each of our steps, the place dark and dingy yellow. I had smoked for years inside. There were all sorts of stuff around old pictures on the wall, candles. We were in the house for a good 10 minutes when we heard someone in the other room get up and start thrashing stuff around violently. It seriously felt like a scene from The Walking Dead. We ran and never looked back. Said house is gone now. There's still a lot of trash on the lot. It'll probably be a $400,000 house in a few months. My friends, who always go exploring, told me about this time they were just following a trail that went into the hills, and after almost reaching the freeway, they ended up near an old closed-up train tunnel. They were able to squeeze through some loose fencing, and after wandering through with nothing of interest, they eventually came to a bunch of shipping containers. They told me that when they glanced inside, they saw a ton of guns and ammo in one and just a shit ton of heavy boxes in the rest. After a few minutes of checking it out, they heard voices from further down the tunnel coming closer, so they got out of there. They also said it almost smelled like the ocean towards the end, so the tunnel might have let out near the beach. As a teen, I was into urban exploration. There was an old ice plant near my house that had burned down around 25 to 30 years prior. Anyway, it wasn't really underground, but it was so overgrown that it felt more or less like it. I go climbing around over and under mangled concrete and rebar and graffiti for a while and finally decide I'm done. A couple of days later, I hear about how the police pulled a corpse out of there. I'm pretty sure I walked right by it and didn't even notice. When I lived in rural Maine, my boyfriend at the time took me on a drive in his truck he said he wanted to show me something he said he learned about from one of his college professors. We already kind of lived in the middle of nowhere, but we drove even further into literally nowhere. We were on this road that was five to eight miles of just forest on both sides. No houses, no signs, no driveways, nothing. Then he pulls over near a slight break in the trees. There was a very overgrown old driveway chained off the road with an old dilapidated sign that said private property. We parked on the road and walked in about half a mile, and there was this old abandoned log cabin house there. I don't know when it was built, but it was old enough to not have any connection to the electric grid and no electrical outlets inside. It was a bit odd, but my boyfriend said he'd been there before and led me to a door in the back where we could break in. 
He mentioned that the last property owner said in their will that no changes could be made to the property after they died. Like no agriculture or major renovations, so I guess that's why the land was never resold, since nobody could do anything with it. I don't remember if we entered through the second floor somehow or climbed upstairs once inside, but I remember being on this lot that overlooked the interior of the house. It had no railing. It was a 15 plus foot drop right at the edge of the lot. Maybe there weren't any stairs inside at all, or a ladder. It was back in the fall of 2011 when I was a freshman in college, so it's a bit fuzzy. I remember seeing an old wood stove made of iron downstairs and a countertop, but otherwise, I think the place was pretty sparse and made entirely of wood. There was also no sink in the kitchen area and no bathroom, so that meant no plumbing either. The loft we were on had literally thousands of dead flies all over the floor. It was creepy and gross. I know they could have gotten stuck there over the years, but the sheer number of them on every surface and not being decayed or turned to dust was just so unnerving. My ex-boyfriend, for some reason, decides that this is a nice place to smoke weed. I didn't want to stay, but he laid a blanket out over the flies, and he sat and rolled a joint. I did take a couple of puffs, but started getting an uneasy feeling, so I stopped. I'm a regular smoker, but this was just a crazy situation. Then suddenly, I realized that the sun was setting, and we were losing light fast. The house very quickly got this terrifying, impending doom feeling, and I knew I just needed to get the hell out of there. I expressed my concerns to my boyfriend multiple times, each time seeming more desperate to leave, but he wasn't worried and he took his sweet ass time hand rolling himself a cigarette and taking all the unnecessary shit out of his pockets, laying them out in the blanket and slowly putting them away. It was pissing me off that he wasn't taking me seriously and I had such a sense of urgency to get out. I ended up getting out of that house first and started hauling ass down that half mile long dirt driveway to get out and away. My ex shuffled behind me, fumbling with things in his hands. I got out of the woods when we were just losing that last light before the true darkness set in. Mind you, this country road has no street lights the whole way. He had flashlights, but I didn't feel that flashlights equaled safety. I felt we were being watched and whatever it was, was really negative. I don't know if I overreacted, or if my ex was literally just doped up and clueless, but I never really trusted him again after that. I don't know why I let myself get in that situation. Needless to say, he's not in my life anymore. About eight years ago, my girlfriends and I would download plenty of fish and meet random guys to take exploring with us. Definitely not the smartest, especially since we were out in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. This one night, we met a guy called Todd. Todd was an odd guy. He seemed socially distant, and when he slid into the back of my SUV, I instantly got the feeling of regret. We were going to a place called Ronnie's Point. Todd wanted to stay in the car for a bit to scope out the area while us girls went ahead to explore. Red flag. I was so sure he was going to try and steal my car. We went into the abandoned hospital and out of nowhere, here comes Todd around the corner. It scared us so bad that we let out a slight scream. Todd started making comments about how his great-grandfather was a security guard at the asylum and that his grandfather told him stories about how they would shoot at the sick individuals for fun. He laughed and said, how much fun would that be? We continued to explore, and Todd just hung out in the background. We eventually left, and Todd insisted on sitting behind me in the car. I needed gas, so I started driving to the nearest gas station. It was maybe about two minutes up the winding road. I felt his slimy hands creep up, 
and start massaging my shoulders. And this is while I'm driving. I kept leaning forward to give him the hint I was not interested. As he is massaging my shoulders, he's telling my friends and I how stupid we are for inviting random strangers out, how we never know who is getting into the car with us, and how they might hurt us, that kind of thing. He started laughing again, and I will never forget the tone of his voice or the grip of his hands on my shoulders. He said, Maybe that person's in the car with you right now. I pulled into the gas station and demanded he got out of the car. He did, and I left him there. We got back home, and my friend went on to plenty of fish to block him, but it turned out he already blocked her or deleted his account. We never heard from him again, but we stopped inviting random people to urban explore and ghost hunt with us. I'm a wildlife biologist. I do a lot of work in Northern California and Oregon, and during the summer I work nights. I'm female and do most of the work solo. Last summer I was hiking in deep woods in Northern California, about an hour and a half from my truck with no cell phone service. Around 1.30 a.m. I'd finished up surveys and was heading back, when I suddenly smelled something odd. I continued up the hill and as I came over the top, I was suddenly on the edge of a large camp. The area was cleared, and I could see several tents and UTVs and trash everywhere. That weird smell, it was a porta potty. I could also see a fire pit with several figures sitting around it. I stopped dead, immediately dropped to the ground, and scrambled behind a tree. I was close enough to hear some mumbled conversation and occasional loud laughter. The only reason there would be a camp that far into the wilderness would be to grow weed illegally. These people can be very violent, and many people involved in the industry go missing every year. Women especially can be swept into sex trafficking, never to be seen again. I got out my spot device, GPS locator, and satellite messaging and I sent my location and situation to my supervisor. I crawled as quietly as possible back down the hill before retracing my steps to take a long way around. My adrenaline ran high until I got to the safety of my truck, and I crashed hard and cried on the phone to my supervisor. That was one of the more terrifying moments in my career. I've had several encounters alone with large predators, but nothing is scarier than encountering a group of strangers alone in the deep woods. I'd like to first say that you don't have to feel bad if you don't believe me, because I struggle so much with believing it too. I wasn't alone. My best friend also saw it, and she struggles as much as I do with not believing what we saw. I'm almost 60 years old, and I'm a wildlife and landscape photographer from East Tennessee. I'm from Townsend, which is located in the Smoky Mountains, and I no longer live at the location where this happened, but I'm still close by. On the night of the new moon in July 2018, my best friend, Deb came over to my house at around 11.30 p.m. because we were going to go up the hill from my house to an empty rental cabin to take pictures of the Milky Way over Rich Mountain. I know it was the night of the new moon because that's the best night of the month for night sky photography since the moon won't wash out the light from the stars. If you stood on my road where you turn into my driveway, it actually looks like you're turning into the driveway of the rental cabin because we shared the same driveway. You pull into the rental and curve left down our long gravel driveway to the mobile home we lived in before we moved into our house where we are now. Straight across the street from the rental cabin is what locals have always called the shale pit. It's just an empty lot, about an acre or two big. 
There's a family from Townsend who owns it, and they use it to dig up shale for new driveways of houses. That was their business. They built driveways, but their part was just to dig it and lay down the shale. They also let the National Park bring trees there to use the space to burn them after they've collected them, whenever they'd have bad storms, strong winds, or heavy snow. There wasn't a house there or any other form of structure, just a big lot with a couple of backhoes for digging. They did put a small mobile home on the lot for the owner's grandson, but that didn't happen until 2020 during the pandemic. Okay, here it goes. Deb and I had taken her car up the driveway to the rental cabin, and we parked right in front, and her car was parallel to the road. The road was about 10 yards from the car, and the entrance to the shale pit was across the one-lane road we lived on, so that would be about 10 more yards. That means 20 yards total from the car to the entrance of the shale pit. We set our tripods up and had each taken a couple of shots of the night sky, when I heard what sounded like tires on gravel somewhere down at the river. You have to cross a bridge over the river to get to my house and all the houses on that road, the shale pit included, of course. I said out loud to her, someone's down at the river. I can't remember if she heard it or not, but just a few seconds later, we heard a loud truck that sounded like it was crossing the bridge and starting up my road. It might be a quarter of a mile from the bridge to my driveway, probably less. We could hear that the truck was going really slow, and it sounded like it was really old and barely running. As it got closer, I asked Deb if she locked her car, since we were on the back side of the cabin, and we couldn't see it from there. She said she hadn't. Deb has thousands of dollars worth of camera gear, and she had a lot of it with her that night. Without speaking, we both took our cameras off of our tripods and carried them and the tripods back to her car to lock it. I don't remember why we brought it all with us. I think we both just had a weird feeling about the truck. I know I definitely did. I don't even know what to say other than it sounded like it was creeping around the area because it was going so slow. I could have walked as fast as that truck was going. When we got back to her car, we set our stuff in the back seat, right as the truck got to where it was even with the cabin and us. It was a dark colored truck, and it looked like it maybe could have been something like a Chevy S10, made back in the 70s or 80s. We couldn't see who was driving, or how many people were in it. The truck stopped and turned into the driveway to the cabin, which means it was also turning into my driveway. It only got two wheels onto the property when it stopped. It backed up across the street into the entrance of the shale pit. Its lights were shining directly into our eyes. It just sat there with its loud, sad motor running. Deb asked me what the hell they were doing, and I said, I don't know, but they're starting to piss me off, because they know they're blinding us with their headlights. I waited about 10 more seconds before I reached into my pocket and pulled out my maglite flashlight and turned the dial around the bulb to high beam. Then I turned it on and pointed it right at the truck. I had intended on shining my obnoxiously bright flashlight at them until they turned their headlights off or drove away. Well, they did turn their headlights off and in turn, I turned my flashlight off. They didn't turn the motor off though. This was creepy and my stomach kind of churned because I thought I'd pissed them off and we were up at that empty rental cabin after midnight and my husband was all the way back down at our house asleep. The truck stayed there for about another half minute and then it finally turned its motor off and it was gone. Yes, I swear upon everything that I've ever loved, that truck just wasn't there anymore. We didn't see it fade away. It didn't turn off like a light switch or television. It just wasn't there anymore. Then Deb and I both did something totally out of character for two old ladies. We ran to where the truck had been sitting. I couldn't say a word, but Deb, well, she yelled over and over. What the fuck did I just see? 
I told her to stop screaming so I could call Jack, my husband. I was hysterical and told him to get up the hill as fast as he could. He also drove up instead of walking and he was there in no more than two minutes. I told him a very short version of what had happened and he went across the street to the shale pit and pulled in as far as he could. It's all just dirt and rock. There aren't even trees there since they dig in that area. The only trees are the ones the park brings there to burn and there weren't any of those at the time. He came back across the street and said there's nobody and nothing over there except two backhoes. They must have left and you all just didn't see them. We explained the whole thing again and he realized that they couldn't have left without us seeing them since we were standing right in front of them. So, he went back over there on foot this time with my flashlight since it has the high beam setting on it. Again, he came back and said there's nothing there. He said he even looked inside the cabs of the backhoes just in case. There's actually a ridge above the shale pit lot, but it's vertical and about a hundred feet high. This one acre lot is literally just dirt and rock with nowhere to go and nowhere to hide, even for a person, let alone a whole truck. We didn't take any more pictures. We went back down to the house, and Jack went inside. I was outside with Deb, and she said, Kelly, there's no need to go in there and try to convince him of what we saw. It's ridiculous, and you can't expect him to believe you. It'll just cause an argument. We saw what we saw, but nobody is ever going to believe us. And now, we don't even believe us. We talk about it sometimes and laugh about it, but it's not really that funny. Because even though we know we saw what we saw, what did we see? If it were a scary movie, you'd think the truck would just turn the motor off first and leave the headlights on and then disappear. But no, it turned off its lights and we could very clearly see the truck sitting just yards from us. The motor goes off and it was like I blinked and it was gone, maybe even in less than a blink. How can an inanimate object be a ghost? I'm not sure I even believe in ghosts at all, but I saw that truck disappear, and as I type those words, I full on understand how ridiculous and stupid it sounds. But it happened, but I don't even believe it. It's a weird place to be in, and Deb is in that exact same place. I believe in God, so I guess that means I believe in the supernatural, since God is supernatural. But I don't believe in disappearing trucks. But I saw one disappear. Can you all understand what I'm saying? I don't believe what I saw, but I saw it. It drives me crazy. Pun intended. In my mid-twenties, I worked at a subacute rehab facility. Generally, these places exist to help those who are struggling after an accident or surgery to regain their mobility and quality of life with the help of physical therapy and around-the-clock nursing care. I worked in a dementia unit. These patients were long-term, and most ended up living out the rest of their days there. Although it was called the dementia unit, our patients were comprised of those suffering from permanent or long-term brain-related conditions. These included dementia slash Alzheimer's, comas, strokes, traumatic brain injuries, and brain tumors. Here are some of the experiences I had while working there. Number one, I had just clocked in for the evening and received report from the day shift nurse. I was standing at the end of the hallway with my back against the wall, reviewing the notes I'd taken from the previous nurse. Whilst reading over my slip of paper, I felt what could only be described as a hand dragging its fingers horizontally across my abdomen. I jerked back and looked around, but I was completely alone. Number two. 
Although I do not have a particular story about call lights, it was a normal occurrence to have call lights in empty rooms triggered, even in rooms where the wires that were attached to call buttons were unplugged from the wall. Some nights, the nurses would be forced to respond to several phantom calls from empty rooms. Number three. At the very end of one of our halls contained a habitually empty room. The heat slash air conditioning unit was broken, so patients were never placed there. The nurses and aides would use that room for privacy during personal phone calls to go to the bathroom in peace or do whatever else that required some seclusion. One evening, I headed into that room's bathroom to touch up my makeup and fix my hair. I left the bathroom door slightly ajar while going about my business. I was putting my hair up in a bun when the bathroom door slammed shut behind me. Mid-heart attack, I spun around and jerked the door back open. The room was empty. The time it would have taken a human to exit the room would have been longer than what it took me to open the bathroom door. I'd also like to note that there was no furniture in the room nothing a human could have hid behind. I'm convinced it wasn't a living person who slammed that door. Number four. One patient we had residing in the long-term unit was a middle-aged woman with severe Down syndrome. She was mostly non-verbal, save for a few words she would utter randomly. She was very sweet and always had a smile on her face. It was my turn to help her eat dinner the night this story takes place. She didn't have the motor skills to eat properly, so I spoon-fed her while we caught up on cartoons on her TV set. But this particular night, she acted completely out of character. I didn't notice at first because I was engrossed in the show we were watching. I failed to notice her attempts to get my attention. She finally resorted to using grunts to call me away from the TV screen. When I did finally notice, she seemed overjoyed with something. Her mouth was stretched into a wide grin, and she was pointing at an empty corner in the back of her room. I could clearly see the corner, but nothing else. I looked back and forth between her and the corner, but I couldn't understand what she was trying to communicate. She was pointing giggling and waving at apparently nothing in the corner. I tried asking her what she was trying to show me, in the form of simple yes and no questions that she could shake or nod her head to. I became uneasy with her actions because I knew she was seeing something that I could not. After I finished up feeding her, I walked back out to the hallway and was immediately approached by a fellow nurse. My stomach sank and I felt queasy while she told me the next door neighbor of the woman I was just feeding had passed away during dinner time. Number five. It's not my story. This was told to me by a fellow nurse. My friend Mary worked the night shift at the same rehab as I, but this story takes place years before I was hired there. Mary was close to one of her patients and she went out of her way to make her feel special. The patient was an elderly woman with no living family and was chronically lonely. Her name was Emily. When Mary bonded with Emily, it became a habit of Emily's to wait by her room's window, so when she saw Mary walking up to the building, she could wave. This became a special occasion for Emily, and the two would wave to one another before and after Mary's shift while she traveled to and from the employee parking lot. Then Emily fell ill and was unable to get out of her bed for a while. Every time Mary pulled up from work, she would check to see if Emily was waiting by the window. When she didn't see her, she would know, walking in, that Emily was sick. This went on for a few weeks. Mary would pull into the parking lot, hoping to see her sweet patient up and out of bed and waiting patiently to wave to her. But then one day, Mary showed up at work and saw Emily standing at her window, peering out over the employee parking lot. Mary was thrilled and hopped out of her car and gave Emily a gleeful wave. But Emily stood motionless and did not react to Mary's exuberant greeting. Puzzled, 
Mary headed into the building, only to quickly find out Emily passed away earlier that day. I hope you enjoyed these stories as much as I enjoy sharing them. Last weekend, my five-year-old and I went tent camping in the Unitas northeast of Utah. The weather was overcast weather. By the time we got done paddleboarding, we made our way back to camp. Once we got back to camp, I couldn't shake this feeling of unease. I mostly shrugged it off, thinking I'm overthinking the safety of my child. One thing to point out, there was a trailer and a truck close to us, but I never saw anyone throughout our experience from there. At around 8 p.m., we started our campfire. We roasted brats and ate snacks. During this time, I would think I heard a crack or a subtle movement, and I thought it was just the embers popping. Once the sun finally set, I noticed it was completely pitch black outside the reach of our campfire, most likely due to the overcast weather. At this point, I decided it's time to pack up our food and take it to the car, but I had this sudden feeling that I was being watched, and I decided to turn my headlamp light on. I faced 30 degrees to the right of me. About 40 to 50 feet from us, I see a small bush-like tree, and above the tree, standing behind it, I see two big circle white eyes with a hint of purple staring at me. The animal or creature was far enough from the glow of the fire that I couldn't see a silhouette of a body, but it was close enough that it was odd behavior and it was only seconds from us if it ran towards us. My first thought was it was a bear standing on its hind legs, just being curious. It looked to be eight feet tall or so. As I had my light facing the creature that was abnormally close to our campsite, I grabbed my kiddo and bear spray, and I told my kid there's a bear behind a tree and assured him we will be fine. This creature just watched us intently. Suddenly, a few seconds later, my intuition screamed, get out now. I then started walking backwards towards my car and told my kid to walk slowly with me. The creature made no movement and tilted its eyes on us as we moved away until my light could no longer reach it. I can't explain this new type of fear I was experiencing. It was unnatural. I think prioritizing my boy's safety allowed me to get us to the car in a much more composed manner. Once in the car, we waited 30 minutes to see if it would come into the campsite to look for food, but nothing happened. I thought perhaps it left and we could sleep in the car to be safe. I decided that I was going to try and grab blankets from the tent, put the fire out, and we can pack out first thing in the morning. I thought wrong. The campsite from the car was about 150 feet away. To the right of us were big trees, and to the left is tall grass and brush. I get out and turn my headlamp on. My light shines toward the brush, and laying low in the brush, I see the white eyes again, staring at me. I decided to try to act big and yell out at the creature, but it made a move towards me, which in return made me jump back into the car and reverse. I tried to shine my car lights towards it, but I couldn't see anything. I decided to find help. I drive down and find a friendly fellow dad camper who's happy to help me pack up my things and leave. He arrives with a much brighter flashlight and his truck. As I'm packing, he sees the eyes and mentions there's two of them. He states they're not moose, deer, cougars, and if it is a bear, it's really odd behavior, and he doesn't know exactly what they are. I face towards where he's shining his light, and I see a second pair of white eyes. At this point, I am terrified. One of them is standing tall, while the other is lower. This time, 
they are much further back, as if they now know there's a new reach limit to the light devices being used. It wasn't until the lower set of eyes decided to stand up and be much taller than the first one, looking monstrous. This made my new friend very uneasy, and he quotes, This has got me on edge. Let's just throw everything in your car and leave. The whole time we're packing out, I would catch these creatures creating a perimeter around us. They just walked around the campground in circles, waiting for something, it seemed. I tried to think of rational possible theories, but the more I think about it, the more I can't shake the feeling that this could have been a skinwalker or something else. They were too smart, intuitive, bold, scary, and didn't act like normal wildlife. Any thoughts on these creatures would mean the world to me. Thank you for listening to this. I was getting goosebumps retelling this story. I've never believed in ghosts. I've openly mocked people that did. I went camping, and my wife and I were going to sleep in the pole barn. We brought the dog into the barn, and immediately she was freaking out. It's very uncommon for such a relaxed and tired dog. She was walking around the air mattress and whining. After about five minutes of me telling her to calm down, a light shines through the aluminum siding. Imagine holding a flashlight on the other side of the curtain doing a figure eight. It seemed like there was some sort of flashlight shining through the aluminum door. I don't mention anything for a few minutes, as I'm questioning everything I've ever known to be true. My wife asks, Do you see that? I say, Oh fuck, you see it too. At that exact moment, I realized we both saw it. It turned out to be the brightest orb I've ever seen. It lit up the whole barn as if it was daytime. It then started floating towards us. I yelled at my wife to run, and the dog was already at the door. We ran as fast as we could, and we didn't dare go back to get the air mattress. Our dog would never walk in that pole barn again. This happened to me when I was six. I was in my bed, sound asleep, when I felt the mattress beside me slowly shift as if someone was lying beside me. I opened my eyes and there was a full-grown adult woman beside me. She wasn't particularly scary, just normal looking, but she was a strange person in my bed. Of course I opened my mouth to scream, but before I did, she put her finger to her lips as if to tell me to be quiet. Her eyes looked very frightened, and she seemed to be silently pleading for me to keep quiet. Of course I screamed my guts out, and I heard my parents getting up out of their bed. The strange woman just looked very sad. Her eyes were full of tears. My dad turned my bedroom light on, and as soon as he did, she just wasn't there anymore. There was no sign of her at all. I slept in my parents' room that night. I was very scared, but even more so, I had a deep feeling of sadness. That was decades ago, and I still remember it clearly. I've had a few run-ins like that, different people though, but never that same woman. The story of Teke Teke will haunt the minds of those brave enough to listen. It tells the tale of a young woman who met a gruesome fate, her body cut in half by a train. Left with only her upper torso, she roams the street with a bone-chilling sound, Teke Teke, Teke Teke, as she propels herself forward with claw-like hands. 
Encounters with Teke Teke are said to result in a gruesome demise. Witnesses describe her bloodied form, her face twisted in agony and malice as she pursues her victims with relentless determination. Some say she seeks revenge for her own tragic end, while others believe she yearns for companionship, luring unsuspecting souls into her clutches. As she's said to carry a sharp saw or scythe, I think the former. Those who hear the ominous sound of Teke Teke's approach are given a fleeting chance to escape, but few can outrun her supernatural speed. When I was a teenager, I was big into skateboarding and building ramps and shit. There was a neighborhood being built behind mine, and I'd go over there on the weekends and get scrap wood and bring it back to my house. You had to go through a little bit of woods and cross a creek to get there. I went one day by myself, and when I crossed the creek and started walking through the woods to the construction site, I could hear a man talking. I stood still to try to hear what he was saying. It was getting louder, as if he was coming through the woods towards me, and I finally heard what he was saying. He made a little jingle, singing, I'm gonna get you. I couldn't hear any leaves crunching, and I never saw anyone. I ran like hell and was slipping while I was trying to climb up the muddy bank in the creek. I don't believe in ghosts or anything, but that's one thing that stuck with me that I cannot explain. Can someone please let me know their thoughts on this? So, I'm 31 and female, and I've been living at the same apartment complex for nearly four years. There's a guy who's about 45 or so, who lives on the same floor as me, and he has for about the past year or so. He is so awful. I usually don't notice or recognize a lot of people who live there, but I quickly started noticing this guy because of how rude he is. Whenever we would happen to go downstairs in the elevator together in the morning before work, he would just mean mug me. And then when we would walk out of the glass doors into the parking lot, I would be walking behind him and he'd let the doors close on me and not hold them open. One day, about six months ago, my fiancé and I walked up behind him, waiting for the elevator, and when he saw us, he was standing in front of us and just shook his head almost in disgust. Keep in mind, my fiancé nor I have ever had a conversation with this man. Then, where things really get strange, about six months ago, I decided to hold the elevator doors open for him when I saw him coming down the hall. He said thank you, and when we got downstairs for the first time ever, he held the doors open for me. The next time my then fiancé, now husband, saw him in the parking lot, whenever he saw my now husband with me, he mouthed, fucking bitch, to himself as he passed us. But to make things worse, Whenever I see him alone in the parking lot, he smiles and smirks at me as he walks past, as if we had history together or like we knew each other personally. It's so weird. But about a month ago, when he saw my husband and I together once again in the mailroom, he covered his face with his mail. Can someone please explain to me what the hell they think is going on with this man? I took a lot of psychology classes in college, and I can't even explain this behavior. I'm getting strange serial killer vibes. Like I said, we've literally never had a conversation with him. My husband and I are both very friendly people, and I feel like we're giving off those vibes. It's so strange. This story takes place in the summer of 2017. My name is John. I live in a rural part of Alabama, but I chose to work in the city. The drive is about 45 minutes or so, depending on traffic. However, 
By the time I pick my son up from the sitter, get dinner, and get home, I've been in the car about one and a half hours. My house is surrounded by trees, and the neighbors are few and far between. It can be pretty lonely living here, but I enjoy the privacy. One evening, I pulled into my driveway and noticed something odd. The doors on my storage shed were wide open. I told my son to sit in the car as I got out to investigate. I didn't see anything missing and closed the doors back. I know the wind had not blown them open because it has two latches that you have to undo in order to get it open. The next day, I looked around and much to my dismay, two weed eaters along with a few other garden tools were missing. I know I should have contacted the police, but I knew there wasn't much they could do at that point. Throughout the week, I had some time off and decided to tackle some yard work that I needed to get done, which included cutting down a medium-sized tree that had grown next to my house. Once I cut it down, it took everything I had to move it to the edge of my property just inside the woods. I planned on cutting it up another day. Fast forward to the next Friday night. I left for work at 7 p.m., picked up my son, and we arrived home at 8.30 p.m. As I pulled into the driveway, my son and I noticed something laying across the driveway. It looked as if a tree branch had fallen across it. As I drove up to it, I thought to myself, there are no trees over my driveway. Once I looked towards the base of the tree, my heart sank to the bottom of my stomach. It was the tree I cut down. I had put it clear on the other side of my property until I could cut it up. I recognized the marking from my chainsaw. I didn't know what to do. My son and I sat there in silence for at least five minutes. I rolled the driver and passenger window down just an inch and listened to hear if anyone was out there. I heard nothing. I then realized in order for me to get to my house, I would have to move the tree. I told my son I was going to get out and move it just enough so we could get past, and I would lock the doors. If anything happens, he could use my phone to call the neighbor who lived the closest. I darted out of my car and moved the tree slightly and raced back. I was terrified. Luckily, my son was ready to unlock the doors for me to get back in. I drove up towards my house and we got in safely. I didn't sleep well that night. The next day, I woke up to find the tree was moved again this time a few feet behind my car. To this day, I'm still baffled at who could have done this or what their intentions were. Next time, I will be smarter and call the police. I do have another question that I can't answer. How did someone know where I put the tree after I cut it down? Whoever had done this had to have been watching me. I had put the tree in the woods. That thought alone is enough to keep me up some nights. Thanks for listening. This happened back in 2018. I was 24 and my sister was 25. We're both native New Yorkers, and there are plenty of stories I have. I think we all know New York is strange. Anyway, we were on a crowded train going to meet up with a friend. There were no seats, so we had to hold onto the pole. It's already a tight squeeze, but this man and this girl, non-related, get on, and they hold onto the pole that my sister and I are both holding. We're talking, and I notice that the man directly in front of us keeps on looking at us, like really looking. I'm already feeling uncomfortable as it is, and it's hard not to pay attention. I try to ignore it by talking to my sister. By the way, we are nowhere near our destination. A couple train stops later, he eventually says to us, 
Are you guys sisters? We both look at one another, feeling awkward, and I'm like, yeah. At this point, I'm praying that the train would hurry up to the next stop so we can get off. I know my sister is thinking the same thing. The other girl is looking at us, and she looks uncomfortable. He smiles and seems to get excited, if you know what I mean. He then says to us, Oh yeah, you guys are sisters, in an incredibly perverted tone. He licks his lips and keeps looking from my sister to me, back and forth. At this point, the girl gives us an awkward smile and she looks just as terrified as we do. I can tell that this man is getting really excited by the fact we're sisters, and he comments on how beautiful we are. My sister looks at me, and we see a stop coming up. We both know it's not our stop, but we're leaving the train. He keeps trying to talk to us, and we keep ignoring him, and as soon as the doors open, we leave the train. Again, I've been in many weird and uncomfortable situations, but the fact that he was literally so close to us with his perverted smile, his excited eyes, and excitement, you know what. Yeah, I'm glad we were able to get away from him safely. Thankfully, he didn't follow us. This is pretty out there, but when I was a child having an asthma fit, my mother gave me some medication, but it got worse, so she gave me more medication, but the two aren't supposed to mix. I started tripping balls, as a three-year-old trips I guess, and I saw a skeleton woman in a black robe. I started hysterically screaming, and my parents had me sleep on a cot in the hallway with the lights on. I kept referring to her as Asmona. My guess is from my mom mentioning the asthma medication and me moaning or something. Little kid stuff. Flash forward eight years or so. Different house, different city. I was getting out of the shower and looked in the mirror. It was Asmona. I screamed and climbed into my bunk and covered myself with blankets, freaking out until my parents found me. My best guess is it was just fog on a mirror that somehow looked close enough to what I hallucinated as a toddler, and that unlocked a repressed memory and caused me to panic. I tried to tell my parents about it, but they just laughed it off and said I was making up both incidents. I grew up on a small property in regional Australia. We lived about three to four kilometers out of town, so not really far, but also far enough we never really got disturbed. On top of that, we were on a dead-end street, down the end of another street off the main road, so not once have I ever seen any pedestrian near my house. Anyway, one night when I was about 12, I was watching TV when two of my brothers came downstairs and said, Did you hear that? I was pretty glued to the TV, so I didn't hear a thing. But apparently, they heard footsteps outside and a couple of hushed voices. Seeing as my brothers were both around 20 and both big rugby playing guys, their plan was for me to wait inside while they ran outside and tackled anybody they could find before calling the cops. So they both sprinted out the front door at the same time, splitting in different directions to wrap around the house and meet again on the other side, presumably each with a criminal wrapped in a headlock under their arm. If you've ever seen that movie, Signs, where Mel Gibson and Walking Phoenix run around the house, basically just picture that. Anyway, they never found them. They swear to this day that they heard voices, but nobody was ever seen. Our property has a lot of thick bushland right up to the house, so all we can think is that when my brothers came out, these guys just dissolved back into the bush and watched. They then probably just took off 
once the coast was clear again. The whole thing scared the hell out of me. One night, I was driving from North Dakota to Nebraska, and I was passing through a section of South Dakota that sits between the Rosebud and Pine Ridge Reservations. I was in the absolute middle of nowhere, no lights for miles, perfectly clear winter sky, amazing stars, and all of a sudden, a meteor burns up in the sky above, turning the sky green for a few seconds. I stopped and just thought about how lucky I was to see that. As I keep driving, I come up to a small town where the only intersection is a four-way stop in the middle of the town. I assumed it was a ghost town because there were no lights of any kind, but as I came to a stop, my car lights lit up the area around me, and people were just walking around in the dark, acting like it was normal. It's the middle of the night, maybe 10 or 20 degrees maximum. Needless to say, I didn't stop again until I got to a town with street lights. I think those areas are a little more wild or spiritual. Wounded Knee was near there, and that part of the US had terrible atrocities committed against the natives. I think it's left its mark on that place. In Snohomish, Washington, there's a bar called the Oxford. It has a violent history, as there have been at least two or three deaths or murders there. My parents have gone a few times to listen to live bands, and heard of women being locked in the bathroom, and plates shattering in the kitchen when no one was around. One night, my dad had a glass of red wine and headed downstairs to the basement, where there's pool tables and another bar. He said that the cup part of his glass exploded in his hand. There was a pop sound. He looked down, and he only had the wine glass stem in his hand, and there was no red wine or glass on or around him. In a bit of a daze, he went to the bartender, handed her the stem, and explained what had happened. She replied, No problem. That kind of stuff happens all the time and she handed him a new glass. Guide spirits, angels, whatever you want to call them. I had a similar thing screw with my head pretty bad once. That same feeling of go here, turn there, like a mental GPS direction. So for important context, I live over 300 miles from where I grew up. I was sitting at my computer one night at like about 10 p.m. and just had this massive urge to get up and go somewhere. So I put on my shoes and jump in my truck. Then it was that feeling, turn here, go there, pull into this parking lot. I just kind of followed it. I had arrived at Whataburger. There are three in my town and this one is the furthest from the apartment I was in at the time. I drove probably 10 miles to reach this one, but I had one that was a mile and a half from my apartment. But food sounded good, so I figured it was just my gut deciding for me. I walk in, and there's this guy stumbling around incoherent, bothering customers and being a nuisance, and generally seeming drunk off his ass. He turns to me, though, and I get a look at him. I had several classes with him in high school. He was diabetic as fuck and let his sugar levels get all screwed up to the point of not being able to function. A similar incident happened in school with him once, so as soon as I recognized him and saw him acting similarly, I got a cup of soda in him to level him out. It took me five seconds to realize what the issue was and save him from probably dying in a county drunk tank, since the store had called the cops already. It's some weird shit. As soon as I saw him, I had the same aha moment of, 
This is what you're here for. This happened about 20 years ago while hunting with my dad in northern British Columbia. It was a cold October morning, and it was still dark when we parked the truck and started our hike into a clear cut. I was familiar with the area as we'd moose hunted there before. My dad went to the left, and I went to the right. I made my way to the top of a slope to get a better view of the clear cut. I found a stump to sit on and took out my binoculars and quickly found my dad in the clear cut across the mountain. As soon as I spotted him, I heard something move behind me in the forest, roughly 40 yards away. I'm thinking, yes, a moose. I then head towards the forest's edge when I hear a scream or screech unlike anything I've ever heard. It did not sound human, and it wasn't like any animal I've heard before. It was so loud and I swear my soul left my body for a few seconds. I turned around and ran down that clear-cut hill as fast as my teenage legs would take me. When I got to my dad, he said he heard it too and found me in his binoculars running down the clear-cut, then looked up at the forest's edge and said he saw a big, hairy, human-like creature standing about eight foot tall between two birch trees. It stayed for a few seconds, and turned around, and was gone. We got to the truck, and went home for the day. We asked elders and relatives about it when we got back, and they called them the Forest Guardians. It still scares the hell out of me. A couple good friends of mine fight fires, and in Washington state, summer business is usually booming. This year, a fair-sized crew of about 10 of them are miles and miles deep into the Cascades doing dig lines. I'm talking like 60 miles away from anything, middle of nowhere. As they're hiking through, they come to a clearing, and there's two landed Black Hawk helicopters and about seven fully armed military personnel. They all point their rifles at the fire crew and demand to know what they're doing there. My friend tells them they're doing fire digs and they're scheduled to be up there. They're told to turn around and forget that they saw anything up there. My friend says, but this is government work. We have to do this. This is our job. One of the military personnel says, Not today. You're done. Get the fuck out of here now. Some serious chronicle type shit. I've never wanted to know so badly about what the hell was going on out there. I was 14 years old moose hunting in northern British Columbia, Canada, with my dad. My feet got cold, so I got down from the tree stand to walk around, get the blood flowing and whatnot. Not 30 seconds later, my dad very calmly says, Mike, get back up in the stand. Being a teenager, naturally, I was defiant. Ten seconds go by, I hear, Mike, Get your fucking ass back in this tree stand, right fucking now. Now, up until that point in my life, I'd never heard my dad say, fuck, like ever. So I figured, hey, maybe I should listen, and I climbed back up the stand. My dad grabbed my face and jerked my head to the right, where I saw an absolute unit of a silver tip grizzly charging down the trail towards where I was standing. Another 10 seconds, and I could have been chow. That is depending on how good a shot my dad would have been. This didn't happen to me, 
but it happened to my mom's friend. One day, the friend and her sister were driving on a freeway, and I don't remember how this happened, but the car crashed and flipped and rolled over five lanes. My mom's friend was the only one conscious, and she was trapped under the steering wheel, and her sister's head was bleeding really bad. She said a normal-looking man, wearing white, appeared out of nowhere, and then came up to them. He took off his shirt to wrap the sister's head, and then he left. When the paramedics arrived, they asked who wrapped the sister's head, and she told them. The paramedics asked where he went, and she pointed to the direction he walked in. The paramedics said they'd just come from that direction, and no one was on the road for miles. They also said that he wrapped her head in such a perfect way that she would have bled out and died if he hadn't done that. Shortly after 9-11, taking a flight home and a guy sitting across the aisle from me told me he blows planes like this one up for a living. I felt instantly lightheaded. I went up front and told the flight attendant. She thought the guy was making a poor attempt to flirt with me. In hindsight, 20 years later, she was probably right, but in the heat of that terrible moment, I was ready to have a full-blown panic attack. If I remember rightly, they landed the plane and the guy was taken for questioning. I was pretty mortified. Actually, I still am. There were probably a lot of mad people who just wanted to get to where they were going. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you'd like me to read on the channel, please send me an email or post it to my subreddit. You can find details of this in the video description. It's the stories that make this, and this is the best way to ensure variety in the stories I share. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my channel members and patrons who now have special access to ad-free videos and other behind-the-scenes content. Leah McBride, Emily Pearson, Tyler Wilson, Lynn Meeks, Kristen Birdo, Shaz, Betty Brantley, Candice Lee, Africa Winfield, Becca, Lydia Adams, Girl Veteran, Legends CBZ 69 2012, Katrina King, Hospital Cakewalk, Dirty Diana, Quinta Siegel, Shirley Porch, Taylor Ruiz, Annalisa Petrie, Jasmine Davis, Janelle Jensen, Jasper Roth, Alex, Monica Levelace, James Gargano, Sarah P, Fire 05, Mad as a Felter, Tierra Sanders, Melissa Kingery, Kitty Cat Luna 2, Chelsea Moffat, Ryan, Gabrielle, Jenny, Sarah, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Sam, Amanda Jane, Vampy Debs, October Gypsy, Rebecca, Erica B, Maribel De Luna, Lloyd Rash, Jennifer Jenkins, Kelly Townsend, Mary Wright, Tara Harris, Elizabeth Knapp, Eddie, Sean Gorman, Sue Gordon, Spider's Web, Kay, Christy, Absinthe Alice, Dina Kingery, Snowball Rathena, Lady Drackard, Brenda, Pretty Girl 215, Amber Davis, Sigma Cube X, Leticia Acklin, Ali O'Neill, Gina Eberhardt, Lilypad, Ashley Nicole, Sarah Chifalo, May 2nd, 2003, Bella Plays, 2006, Skin Crawler, Stephanie McLaren, Borderline Betty, Kuro, Top Off, Kelly Ann Bain, Michael O'Malley, Neil Kavanagh, The Dead Movie Society, Diana Johnston, Taya Atwell, Danielle, Possum Posse, Crafty Kell, Brooke, Scott McKenzie, Megan Abrams, Jane Wiggins, Jasmine Davis, Jack White, Your Pappy's Dilly, Emma Lisa, Tanya Ferguson, 
the Wendy, Ember Hops, Alexia Tuttle, Ram Beltran, Elizabeth Mares, Unladylike 13, Pegasus Genesis, Sheila Grant 44, Sona, Scout Mom 405, Cheryl Duckworth, Ashley Bray, Angela Reeves, Kim Thompson, Brock Bollard, Nick Bigdowski, Jessica Lasley, Yennefer, Clary Scott, Timothy Stratton, Melissa Kingery, Shane Stevens, Serge Vargas, Bart in Real Life, April Jordanet, Lisa Prentice, Mason Hayes, Sarah Price, Jasmine Thomas, Angie Lindon, Z Harris, Kirby Harris, Yolo Sapien, Lavina Cordelia, Misty Racure, Michelle Green, Dixie Busby, Paula Ferreira Nieves, Samantha Place, Donna Cox, Stephen Wheeler, Melissa Moore, Deshaun Edmondson, This Bad Kitty, Gloria, Christina Myway, Connie Sue, Carol Zaffirano, Merciful Humming, Kelsa Rundle, Ashley Juster, Vicki Howell, Joe Tozer, Zoe D, Nicholas Johnson, Kimmy Love. Once again, thank you guys for listening. Have a great night.